All right, so we're going to go through Acts 16 today, get some of the lessons here. This is Paul's now missionary journey to Philippi. So you can see in this chapter what actually brings him to Philippi. And in Acts 16, this is one of the you know, one of our favorite passages when it comes to soul winning because it's the story of the Philippian jailer and the great verse in Acts 16, 30 to 31. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So this is where, this is the chapter that that verse comes from, but now you're learning, you know, this sort of the events surrounding it, which is good. It's always good to understand. It gives you a bit more uh, comprehension of the story and how they, how they arrived there, which is good. So a couple of lessons that we're going to learn from Acts 16. So the first section we're going to look at because in Paul's missionary journeys here, this is where he actually meets Timothy. And I think Luke actually joins him too, as you see in this chapter, um, who is actually the writer of the Gospel of Luke and um, Acts itself. So first part of the chapter is where Timothy joins Paul, Acts 16. So if you remember in Acts 15, right, there was the strife between Barnabas and Paul, and now they're going back because Paul wanted to say, hey, let's go back to the churches that we had helped to plant and let's see how they do. And remember there was a contention between them, so he went with Silas and then um, Barnabas went with Mark uh, and, uh, because Paul didn't want to take him at the time. <clears throat> so now he's travelling back through. So you remember Derby and Lystra was in the regions of Lycaonia, this is where, that's where they, he was almost stoned to death. And now he's back through coming and uh, visiting the churches and, and uh, uh, you know, following up with uh, back with the disciples and the churches that they had helped to plant. Then came he to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus. So this is the Timothy of First and Second Timothy, the son of a certain woman which was a Jewess and believed, but his father was a Greek, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. So Timothy is like one of those characters in the Bible that really encourages, you know, either single parents or parents where only one of the parents really are trying to live for God and the other isn't. So you can see here that Timotheus was of mixed parents, right? His mother, his grandmother was, you know, is, is from Israel, a Jew, but the father was a Greek. Right? So uh, usually what is believed here about Timothy is, you know, the father being a Greek did not have his family following like Jewish tradition. This is why Timothy was not circumcised at the time. Right? So a lot of his teaching and Tim Tim Timothy's teaching came from his mother and grandmother. So in 2 Timothy 1, look at what Paul writes to Timothy about. When I call to remember, it's the unfeigned faith that is in thee. What does unfeigned mean? Un, when something is feigned, it means it's fake. It's not real. It's not genuine. All right? Because there are some people that they, they talk the talk, right? But they don't walk the walk in their Christian life. But he's saying when he calls to remembrance the genuine, the, the, not the fake faith that's in Timothy, look, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. So the encouragement here, with, one of the encouragements in Timothy's life is that Timothy's spirituality is heavily attributed to his Jewish mother and grandmother, even though his father was a Greek and did not follow all the teachings of the Jewish customs, right, which is, which is back then. So that gives, you know, a lot of parents who are maybe single parents, um, parents with an unbelieving spouse, it shows that they can have a lot of influence on their children's spiritual direction, even with an unbelieving partner, like we see here. And not only is it the mother, but you can see the second, talking about teaching your sons, teaching your son's sons, that even it started with Lois, the grandmother, having an influence on Eunice, and then Eunice having an influence on Timothy, and then look at the sort of man Timothy became, right? And, and to the point where he has two epistles written to him, one of the close um, uh, disciples of Paul. And you can see that 
even in this chapter, he was so submissive to Paul's leadership that he even ended up getting circumcised. And we're going to talk about that in a moment. 2 Timothy 3. Look at what the Bible says here about Timothy. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. So this is Paul writing to Timothy as his protege and obviously one of the first bishops. Um, I think he was the first bishop of, of Ephesus, Timothy. And that, from a child, thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So you can see there the faith of Lois and Eunice teaching Timothy the scriptures from a little child and the sort of man that that raised, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And then this is where we get the famous verses that we have in our memory verse list as well. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So you see how that verse about the scriptures being profitable is in the context of Timothy being taught the scriptures from a little child and look at the man that he's become for instruction for right that the man of God may be perfect thoroughly furnished unto all good works let's go on Acts 16 3 him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters for they knew all that his father was a Greek and as they went through the cities they delivered them the decrees for to keep. So what was that? Because remember, they got some instruction in Jerusalem, right? And as they're going through the churches, they're, they're sharing that instruction as well that we talked about last week, um, the last time we, we preached on Acts. That were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. So those were the rules that they'd kind of set in place with churches, with Jew and Gentile, to kind of keep the peace. Not necessarily things that were sinful things that things that may have been lawful but not expedient for those churches now in here it says here him would paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the jews now what you might be thinking here is is this a contradiction with chapter 15 because remember when we preached on acts chapter 15 paul was like condemn you need to be circumcised to be saved christ shall profit you nothing and then in the next chapter over it's like well now he's going and circumcising timothy so how, how do we align this? How, how, what, what's going on here, right? Why did he forbid Titus to get circumcised, who was a, had Greek parents, but then Timothy, who was raised by a Jew and a Greek, right? He circumcised him and it was fine. Well, let's go first here so we can remember the story. Galatians 2, then 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. Right? So, why was Titus forbidden to be circumcised. But Timothy, Paul went and got circumcised. Right? So the reason why, the, what, what's, what's happening here is, you see, Titus was a Greek. right? And what was happening in Titus's situation is that people were coming in and teaching they had to be circumcised to be saved. So Paul was then you know, making the point, no, no, people don't get circumcised to be saved. And him being a Greek, he had no reason to be circumcised. So the only reason why he would be doing it is trying to seek justification by the law. Now, what is happening in Timothy's case, which is different? In Timothy's case, he was raised by Lois and Eunice. They knew that he had a Greek father, right? And, and they already knew that they were like, uh, sort of, like sort of well-known in that area, that they were living for God. But now Timothy is going to accompany Paul on his travels, right? And Paul is going to be mixing with a bunch of, you know, unbelieving Jews. Now, what was the attitude of unbelieving Jews, if you remember? So this is why Timothy's case is very different. He was able to get circumcised, because his, fa his father was Greek, but he was of Jewish descent. So what is actually happen is happening here in Acts 16, Paul is actually using the liberty that they have in Jesus Christ in order to 
become all things to all men, right? Because he knows that they, that they will have more trouble trying to reach the Jews if Timothy wasn't circumcised. So this is not about circumcising Timothy because people think you need to be circumcised to be saved and he's trying to appease them. This is about circumcising Timothy. So as he goes to reach unbelieving Jews, there's less of a stumbling block there. So that's why there's no contradiction here. It's just that there's liberty in Jesus Christ. It's not that getting circumcised is sinful in and of itself, right? But if somebody's trying to do it to be saved, that's what's being condemned. But if they do it here because he's half Jew, in order to be more things to more men so that by all means I might save some, that's what's happening here in Acts 16. So in 1 Corinthians 9 it says here, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews, look at this, I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews, to them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I have made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Right? So I guess it would be similar. It's just coming up with examples off the top of my head. You know, maybe if you're of like, say, like Indian descent or something, and then you go to India, they don't expect like, a, like maybe a, a, an Australian to be wearing the garb and everything like that. But maybe it's an Indian, you'd go there because they expect that. So it's just like less of a stumbling block. So I think this is what is going on here which is why Paul had Timothy circumcised, so that when he travels with him, there's not that stumbling block to the Jews that he's trying to reach. And we see that stumbling block as we went through the book of Acts. I mean, remember Peter, when he went to the Gentiles, says here, and the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter was come unto Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him, saying, thou wentest into men uncircumcised and did eat with them. So you've got to see like how strong that cultural thing was with the Jews that you know, even ones that were saved still struggled to overcome that, right? Where Peter, Peter, they hear that Peter went into people uncircumcised and they give him a hard time and they're having to undo that with the Jews. So even Paul, if you remember, Paul withstood Peter to the face because of that. Galatians 2.11, And when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. So you can see that culture is there very strongly. And that's what Paul is trying to, to sort of cater to in terms of reaching unbelieving Jews. But you see here, where he's taking a hard stand is amongst believing Jews. See, believing Jews were still not mixing with Gentiles and having that frame of mind, and he was trying to change believing Jews. But when he went to unbelievers, he wasn't always trying to correct everything first. That's why when he went to the Corinthians, you remember in Corinthians he says, when I went among you, I... I I, what do you say? I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. So you see there, there's, a, there's an order at which he tries to approach things. He tries to get them saved first. And as now they're growing, then now he's exhorting them to get rid of all these things that were uh, vain and unprofitable. Right? So <clears throat> that's what's happening there in terms of um, that circumcision of Timothy. So what's the lesson we can take away from this? Well, to be an effective soul winner, we need to be aware of these cultural biases. Right? We can't just be completely uh, ignorant to them. And we also can't just like, go into another culture and just think, well, we just be our own culture. Because it's not, this, it's not the attitude that Paul had where it's, I have become all things to all men. You know, it's like even when I, you know, you, one thing um, I learned when, uh, say, dealing with, with Muslims, right? I remember when we first started soloing in Punchbowl, you know, I thought, hey, well, being friendly is just shake their hand, right? But then I learned, no, you don't shake, you don't shake a Muslim woman's hand, you know, you gotta say hello. So, you know, these are the sort of things where, you know, you can try and 
be a bit softer and, and try and reach another culture if you understand things that they find offensive. So this is what's happening in that first section of Acts 16. All right, so let's go on. Now we get on to Lydia. Lydia of Thyatira. All right, Acts 16, verse 6. Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, after they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. So before we, get, before we meet Lydia, what's interesting in this passage here is that it says here they were actually trying to preach the gospel in certain areas, but God is stopping them. Right? Now, I don't know how he's doing it, whether he's just the circumstances of stopping them from going to a certain area, but in verse 6 it says they were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. So something stopped them, right? Was it circumstances or was it direct communication from God, right? And then it says they tried to go into Bithynia and Mysia, but the Spirit suffered them not. So what we see here in the book of Acts is a few times in the book of Acts, the Spirit expressly gives the disciples instructions. Look at in Acts 8, 29. This is when the Spirit talks to Philip. The Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. Acts 10, even when Peter, after he had the vision of the handkerchief coming down with all the animals in it, says, while Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, behold, three men seek thee, arise therefore and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Even when we looked at Acts 13, when uh, Paul and Barnabas went out on their missionary journey, it says here, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. So the question here is, I mean, do dreams and visions, and we're going to see a vision later of, you know, the man in Macedonia, ask them to come to preach to them. Do dreams, visions, and direct communications with God still happen today? I mean, because these are not gifts, right? So we think gifts have ceased. Um, because you know, the reason why gifts have ceased is because there's no longer apostles to pass those gifts on. But these are not gifts, right? This is just God operating like miracles, dreams, visions, even communicating directly with somebody. Now, my view is, like, I wouldn't rule out the possibility because, you know, these are not spiritual gifts. I think God can work in ways, and we see in Acts that God can communicate directly with people, give them direct instructions and things like that. Um, so when it says that the Spirit didn't allow them to go here, they were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach in this area, you know, it could be like this, where God has actually given them, has closed the door, right, for whatever reason, and they're not really sure. So I think it is possible. I'm, I'm of the persuasion that these things, it's possible for them to happen. But the danger here is a lot of the people that are into these sorts of things, the danger is, is they tend to be more emotionally driven because it's still, even if you get a dream or a vision or a direct communication from God, it still needs to line up with the scriptures. And that's the problem is, is usually when I come across somebody that is really into big and dreams and visions, and I have a friend that in Perth is the same, right? He's really into these things and we argue about it because I can't really prove to him that it's ceased. So he's like, you know, hey, well, they happen. I'm like, okay, well, they happen. And he says to me, like, you know, maybe you don't get dreams and visions because you don't believe in them. I'm like, maybe not, you know, I just don't, I lack the faith to have them. That's why I don't get these, these direct communications. I just feel like, you know, the, the word of God's sufficient for me. But I don't think I can rule them out. But like I said, a lot of the people I talk to, not, not my friend in Perth included, but just other people, and it's usually in the Pentecostal, uh, circles where they say, God told me this, God told me that. Oftentimes, God's telling them to do things like contrary to the scripture. You know, God's getting them to feel things that are contrary to the scripture. So one thing's for sure. If you get a dream or you get a vision or you get a direct communication from God, it's never going to contradict God's word. So you still have to know God's word to judge whether that thing, that personal experience that you had, 
lines up with God's word because, you know, there's also other forces that are out there maybe trying to influence people and you need to be able to discern between what is of God and what is not of God and the way you discern that is through God's word, all right? But like I said, my view is I would not rule out, just like I don't rule out that miracles happen. So when we talk about gifts, we're talking about actually passing something on from one person to another, the laying on of hands and giving that gift over. We're not saying that God can't perform miracles. Like now, if God wants to just miraculously give somebody another language in order to preach the gospel to somebody, can he do that? Yeah, I'm not ruling that out. God can do whatever he wants, right? So miracles happen. Dreams and visions can happen. Direct communication can happen. I'm not going to limit God and how he operates and how he decides to interact with his creation and, and things like this because we see it throughout all the Bible. But does it happen as often? Does everyone who claims for it to happen definitely happens? You know, I'm a bit skeptical sometimes, but definitely wouldn't rule it out. Acts 16, 10. And after he had seen the vision, so this is, uh, um, uh, oh, sorry, Acts 16, uh, let's go on, verse 8. And, and they passing by Mysia came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia, praying him, saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. So this is now we learn how, what brought them to Philippi, right? They actually wanted to go preach in the regions of Asia and all that. They wanted to stay there, but the, the, but the, the, the door was closed to them. And then a vision came where somebody from Macedonia saying, saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. So this is what brings them to Philippi, because Philippi, like I said, is one of the chief cities in that area. And after he had seen the vision immediately, we endeavoured, so this is what's interesting about this verse here, Luke actually starts talking in like the, in the collective, right? We endeavoured to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. So in Acts 16, not only does Timothy join the company, right, from Lystra and Derby, but also a lot of people believe this is where Luke also joined Paul's company because this is the first time he actually... Um, refers to himself as we and us, and from then on, it's like you can see that Luke is actually now traveling with Paul. Now, you notice here that when they got the vision, they realized this is why God was stopping us from going and preaching the gospel in these other areas, because he wanted us to go to Macedonia. So what is the lesson here? The lesson here is, you know, they didn't know this until after the vision. But the lesson for us is sometimes God closes doors for us and we don't always understand the reason why at the time, right? But then you, if you've done all you can in a situation and you can't progress it any further, it could be, you know, it could be in work, it could be in like, you know, your education, it could be anything in life where, you know, you've done everything in your power to try and progress that situation. Like they were going, they were going to preach, they wanted to go here, they wanted to go to this area, but they were being stopped. You have to have the faith that maybe God doesn't want you to go in that direction, you know, and not necessarily lose your joy or get upset. Maybe God is closing a door and you don't realize why. So here, God closed the door to them and then they understood later when another door opened, this is why, you know, that door got closed. And like I said, you can apply this principle to any area of life. You know, sometimes younger people, they may apply this principle to um, relationships. You know, you, you try and make that relationship work, can't come to an agreement, and it's just that maybe that door is closed. But, you know, as you live life, you realize, well, that, maybe that door is closed because another door opened, and that was who, who, uh, who God would have you to meet. Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothracia, and the next day to Neapolis, and from thence to Philippi. So this is the door that opens, this is how they get to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia, and a colony, and we were in that city abiding certain days. Verse 13, and on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made, and we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. Now, I thought this was really cool, and you know, maybe it's got, it's got me thinking because I do want to get like, you know, we got to have some more regular prayer meetings and things like that. Um, it's definitely something that's been on my mind. But what I thought was cool here is that in this city, 
there was a location that was known where people just went to go pray. It's like he's saying, like, they went to Philippi, and by the riverside, it was, like, known in the city that this is where women of the city came and gathered, and they prayed there. Isn't that cool? And then they went there. This would be like, you know, like a street evangelist. And they went to like this public area of people, you know, and they sat down with the women and they got to know some of the women there that were there praying. So I thought that was kind of cool that, you know, in a local area, that place is known as a place of, uh, as a place of prayer. I just thought that was cool. Um, verse 14, a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. So this is where we meet Lydia of Thyatira. And, you know, Lydia is just some, somebody they meet in Acts, and it's just like a, a great example to, uh, you know, Christian women. And this is why I think she's mentioned and, and the things where she helped Paul. And when she was baptized and her household, she besought us, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. So a couple of things about Lydia. Of Thyatira. So Lydia is a great example of a godly woman. Right? We see here not only is she a woman of prayer, right? she's down by this river praying with the other women that resorted there. So not only is she a spiritual woman, a woman of prayer, we can see that she is a hard-working woman. Look, a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple. What is that? So she's selling clothing, she's selling materials. So not only is she a woman of prayer, but she's also a resourceful woman too, even able to generate income for her family, like the virtuous woman in Proverbs 31, right? She buyeth the field and you know, she makes money for her family. So just because you're at home, that doesn't mean you can't be resourceful. That doesn't mean you can't help generate income for the family. It just means your primary responsibility is taking care of the home, right? of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us. So you see how she's open to learning the things of God, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of by Paul. So not only, not only, only of that, so she's a, her, she had an ability to create an income, she was also extremely hospitable. I mean, she wanted to put up Paul and his company to stay with her, right? Um, and I think partly that is because she realized, she recognized that these people were apostles and had something to learn. So I think she also got a benefit from that too, which is why she constrained them to stay. But it shows her hunger to want to learn God's word that she was saying, I want you to stay with us so we can learn more from you, right? Uh, with Paul and his company. Now, not only that, look at the influence that Lydia I mean, this is a lady now, because we always think of like influence, and we already looked at Timothy. Remember Timothy? Huge influence on Timothy was who? The grandmother, the mother. And now we see here Lydia, the lady of the house, has a huge influence over her house. Look, when she was baptized and her household. So you kind of expect that, like we see later in the Philippian jailer, where the jailer, you know, gets saved, and that has an influence on the house. And I don't know where this statistic comes from. You know, they say like 33% of statistics is made up anyway. But, you know, whatever the statistic is, they say like, you know, the man gets saved, you know, 75%, the rest of the families get saved. The woman, maybe there's a lower chance of the family getting saved. But my point here is there's, there's that opportunity. There's still that opportunity there for the lady of the house to have a huge spiritual impact on her family. And see, we can see Lydia here has a large impact on her family. She is hearing the things of Paul. You know, she's hearing about the gospel, hearing about baptism. Now she's getting baptized and her influence and influences the other people in her family as well to believe and be baptized. Now, Lydia is often used as an example of infant baptism. What do I mean by that? Baptizing children who do not believe. Right? And why do they say that? Because it's just saying, oh, well, Lydia believed, she got baptized, and then she just baptized all the kids. But is that what it says? <laughs> That's not what it says, right? It just says she was baptized, and her household was baptized too. But is the assumption then that she just got a bunch of unbelievers baptized? No, the, the, the assumption then is that they all believe too, right? So she obviously influenced them to learn from Paul. Remember, Paul's staying with them. Other people get baptized too. And when you compare that with scripture with scripture, you see how that's the same. I mean, you know, you think about uh, 
you know, Acts 8.37, right? What doth hinder me to be baptized? If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And we will see later, as we get onto the Philippian jailer, to give more context to these situations, I can't imagine that it would be different with Lydia, but we'll come back to that. All right? So let's, let's move on. So that was Lydia. Great example of a godly woman. Somebody, you know, so, you know, we have Ruth, you know, everyone knows she's a virtuous woman. Proverbs 31, Lydia is another one to take example of as well. All right, third section is the possessed damsel, the possessed damsel, Acts 16, 16. It came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. Now, what is soothsaying? Soothsaying is like fake prophecy, right? So real prophecy, the Bible say prophecy, it could be teaching God's word or it could be telling future events, right? But then soothsaying, this word is used in the Bible to specifically talk about like false prophecy. So my, maybe modern day examples might be like tarot cards, you know, horoscopes, uh, you know, uh, crystal balls. You know, people go, they go to the mystics and they look into the crystal ball and uh, see it's this sort of stuff. So this damsel possessed with the spirit of div divination. Sometimes you think, well, is she possessed? Is she like the crazy man in the grave that's just like tearing himself and whatnot? No, I don't think necessarily this woman is just like crazy, you know? I just think she's possessed with the devil, giving her some supernatural ability, but it's still fake nonetheless because it's, it's, it's satanic as opposed to, it's demonic as opposed to of God, right? But because she's possessed of this devil, she still recognizes who Paul and his company are, right? So that's what soothsaying is. Palm reading would be another example, you know. And we learn of this lady, she was obviously being taken advantage of too because the masters who owned this lady who was possessed of, of, with the spirit of divination were using her to make a lot of money, right? Because, you know, maybe some of the things she's saying comes true. Now, this is where you have to be careful with supernatural things. Just because something is supernatural, that doesn't mean it's of God. Right? Remember in uh, Matthew chapter 7, you know, when the people come to the, Jesus, they say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works. Then will I profess unto them, you know, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. Right? So just because people do miracles, even if they can soothsay, which, you know, you may not be able to tell that this is just fake prophecy, that doesn't mean like she didn't have the power to tell, you know, these certain things. So she did have the power, but that didn't mean she was of God, right? She was still uh, like a, a possessed of a spirit. So she now, same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, these men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. So here she's actually saying something right, even though what she's possessed by is like a devil, just like the other devil, like the, the one in the grave would bow down to Jesus and say, you know, what have I to do with thee, Jesus? You know, you come to torment us before the time. So in the same way here, this lady who is possessed with the spirit of divination is still recognizing the servants of the Most High God. And you know what it reminds me of? It just reminds me of like even false religions want to acknowledge Jesus to give try and credibility to their false beliefs. You know, it's like when you go and talk to Muslims and then they say, oh, you know, we believe in Jesus too. And Muslim, you know, even like Buddhists, when you talk to them, Hindus, like they'll say, like, oh yeah, we respect Jesus as well. We respect all of us. So they just want to lump Jesus in with their false beliefs to try and uh, give it more credibility, even though Jesus, you know, rebuked false religions. Verse 18, and this did she many days. So now she's following her, like following them, sort of saying, Hey, these are the servants of the most high God, but Paul knows this is she's she's possessed of a spirit. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hours. It's interesting there that the Spirit is referred to with a masculine pronoun, but it's obviously possessed of a, in a lady. Um, I'm not sure the reason why. I guess because, you know, false, false spirits are always uh, masculine, right? It's like angels are always masculine. <clears throat> All right, let's go on. So... 
Verse 19, when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers. So now you understand why. What brought, what put Paul and Silas in prison? Right? Were they doing anything wrong? They just, they healed a woman possessed of a devil. But the reason why they were so angry is because that woman possessed of a devil was making them a lot of money and drew them into the marketplace under the rules and brought them to the magistrate saying, but look at, look at their reason for why they want them incarcerated. These men being Jews to exceedingly trouble our city. As he says, it's not about their hip pocket, right? When they then go to the rulers, you know, the powers that be, it's, oh, you know, look at that, they're a trouble on our society. You know, we're trying to do this for the good of everyone, but their real intention is for the good of their own hip pocket, right? And teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. So you may not have realized this, the condition that Paul and Silas were sitting in in Philippians chap, uh, in, in Acts chapter 16 with the Philippian jailer. So they rent off their clothes so they're naked, right? Commanded to beat them. And when they laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison. So you can imagine, I'm, I'm sure in those days, the prisons are not all air-conditioned and ventilated and have, you know, PlayStations in them and TVs in them like they have today, right? They're all the way in the deepest, darkest dungeons, probably where it's all moldy and musty and disgusting, right? So not only are they in the worst part of the, of the prison, but they're like naked and beaten and have open wounds. They were scourged, right? Thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. Now, before we get on to like, you know, more with Paul and Tyson, the Philippian jailer, I want to talk about this, this, this lady of people that were taking advantage of her. So you can see here that the people that owned this lady that had the spirit of divin divination, they didn't care for her well-being. And even P Paul, Paul cared for her well-being enough to cast that demon out and cause all these problems. But what I want to say here is this situation, when I think about it, is just very similar to big pharma and other large industry lobby groups today that, you know, they go and compel the government to in, introduce legislation, get rid, stamp out competition, censor things and all that sort of stuff. And every time they go do it, it's always in the name of like safety, security, looking after your well-being. But what is their true agenda? Like what was the true agenda here? It was the love of money. You know, why were they upset at Paul and Silas casting out this devil? because their hip pocket was hurt. And sometimes I wonder, it's the same today with like big pharma. You know, it's all about, oh, we're trying to keep you safe and healthy. Is that really why they're pushing the vaccines? Or are they pushing the vaccines because they've spent billions of dollars in R&D and now they have to go peddle this, you know, thing to try and make their money back? Or it's just all about money. I think the same with like, you know, because, you know, I, I provide raw milk for my family, right? And I find it very annoying that they, you know, outlaw raw milk, and it has to be pasteurized. And I always, you know, it's always because, oh, because we have to protect you because, you know, you won't, you don't know how to, you know, even though people have been drinking raw milk for like thousands and thousands of years, you know, they have to protect you from yourself. And you just wonder what lobby groups are at play that are just protecting their hip pocket. So a lot of this stuff in the world, a lot of the evil when it comes to our nutrition and our health and all this, they don't care about our health, just like they didn't care about this woman's health. They didn't care about what was best for her. They were worried about their own hip pocket. So it reminds me of the verse in 1 Timothy 6, 9. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. Right? So do the powers that be, you know, in our government and in 
powerful bureaucracies and lobby groups, you know, do they have our, do they really have what our, be, our best interests at heart or is it more about the money? I know you guys here, you know, have a healthy skepticism of government, but a lot of people don't believe that. You know, a lot of people think, you know, government's there to look after our best interests, they're there to take care of us. And I, I just see this same sort of parallel in this story here. So let's go on to the Philippian jailer. The Philippian jailer is the last section. Philippian jailer. Now we understand Paul and Silas's situation. I think we can appreciate this verse a little bit more. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Now I remember when I got arrested sitting in that jail cell, and you know, this is like, you know, you can, you can use the toilet when you want to, you can ask for a cup of water, you know, you can your air conditioner is lighting there. That was still pretty miserable, do you know? But here, I mean, they don't know when they're getting out. Not only that, they're in this dungeon and it's, oh, it's miserable. You just think, yeah, look, look at their mindset that they are able to praise God and to sing praises in that moment. Now, I don't just think that there is a, you know, some, sometimes you, you picture in your mind the disciples are just a bit, um, you know, how do I describe this? They're just like always joyful, you know what I mean? Like, do you ever get that picture in your mind where like, man, the disciples just, you know, it's like you see like the kids' uh, cartoons and, you know, even though, uh, you know, they're getting uh, persecuted and whatnot, and Paul and his missionary journal, a big smile on their face and they're just always joyful. It's almost like, like the Ned Flanders, right? The Ned Flanders where it's just always happy and sometimes you get this picture in your mind that they're in this dungeon but man, they're just joyfully serving the Lord. They're just, they're just joyful that they're getting persecuted. I don't, but I don't think that's the case. I think, they, 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 you know, you read Paul's epistle, he genuinely struggled. And I think here, it's not that they're just, oh, they're just always joyful that they're singing to God, even though they're in this dungeon. I think part of it is they are singing praises and praying to, to cope with that discouragement. You know, because that's, this is the power of singing. It's not necessarily you sing because you're joyful. Sometimes you ought to pray and sing because you need to fill yourself with joy. Like here. So this is why I think it's, it's more that. They're, they're in this terrible situation. They're trying to think about how to encourage themselves. So they're praying and they're singing praises to God. Colossians 3, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So that was a thought I had when I just think of them in that, in that dungeon. Suddenly there was a great earthquake. I'll go over this a bit quickly because this, is, this story we're a bit more familiar with, with the Philippian jailer. So that the foundations of the prison were shaking. So as they're praying and they're at like this low point, right, trying to encourage themselves, a miracle happens, right? So the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loose. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. So usually, you know, the, the prisoners, when they, when they keep prisoners, it's like their life or theirs. If you let them escape, then you, you'll forfeit your life. So he's, he's worried here because he's thinking the prisoners are escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice saying, do thyself no harm for we are all here. So they didn't just escape, which is very interesting. And we learn a bit later on why. But even though the prison door's open, you remember Peter was told to just walk out. But here, the prison door's open, but Paul didn't leave, right? Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out. And this is our great verse. And said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? So he was worried about his own life. So he, you know, that, that threat of uh, his own life, he's worried about his eternal salvation. What must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Now this is where I want to tie this. I don't want to talk so much about salvation by grace, but this is a perfect verse. But what I want to tie this story into, I want to tie it back to what I talked about Lydia, about people trying to use Lydia for infant baptism. Because some people try and use the Philippian jailer for infant baptism too, and they say, hey, the jailer believed and his whole house got baptized. Well, let's look a bit deeper at this actual story. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord 
and to all that were in his house. So when we have the verse, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house, that's not saying, well, if you believe, then everyone else is automatically going to get saved. And this also doesn't mean if you believe, then everyone else, you just baptize everyone else. But what it's saying here is like, if you believe, and you know, we also preach it to your house, then they're going to get saved too if they believe the same thing. Because we see in verse 32, and they spake unto him the word of the Lord, look at this, and to all that were in his house. See, so it wasn't just the Philippian jailer that got the gospel, it was also everyone in his house too. And he took them the same hour of the night, washed their stripe, and was baptized, so the jailer was baptized, he and his straightway. So all his house got baptized too. But look at what it says here in verse 34. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. So you see here, this is not an example of infant baptism and a parent just baptizing all their children because he's just following the command of God. And just No, no. The whole house got baptized because the whole house believed. Right? And if they believe, then yes, they get baptized. So my question to those people that use Lydia is, is why would Lydia's situation be any different? Right? Do we assume then that Lydia's situation is Lydia got saved and then baptized a bunch of kids and then the Philippian jailer, but when he got baptized, the Bible specifically tells us the whole house was preached to, the whole house believed, the whole house got baptized. So the, the, the assumption then with Lydia would be it's the same situation, right? So this is the verse that I quoted before, Acts 8, where Philip and the eunuch, see, here is water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So it all kind of lines up, right? So the Philippian jailer, you know, not an example of infant baptism, just like Lydia is not an example of infant baptism. Um, so keep that in your pocket because that's important for people that believe in infant baptism. All right, last couple of verses, Acts 16, 35. When it was day, the magistrates sent the sergeants saying, let those men go. So this is why I think it's interesting because in Peter's example with the jailbreak, he's just let out and he just walks out. He's told to walk out. Here, a miracle happens. They, they, they have the ability to just walk out, but they don't, right? And, you know, one could be because it led to the salvation of the Philippian jailer. But what I think it is, is this is a city of Rome, and or this is a, under Roman rule, and Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, right? And they knew their rights. This is what is interesting here, is we see here that Paul, even though being a believer and a Jew, was not oblivious to his rights as a Roman citizen. Right? So it's like us. We know we're believers first. We're Christians. But does that mean we are just oblivious to our rights as Australian citizens? This is why it's very important that we know our rights. We exercise our rights, right? If you don't use them, you lose them. So here, we see here that Paul is not only, because you know, a lot of people say, oh, you know, I don't need to know all that stuff, I'm just Christian first. No, no, he knew his rights as a citizen of Rome. And he knew that they would be in trouble for unjustly beating them and putting them in prison. And the keeper of the prison told this saying to Paul. So now the prison, prison guard, so it comes to them, the Philippian jailer, says, hey, they're letting you go. He says, go in peace. Verse 37, but Paul said unto them, they have beaten us openly, uncondemned, being Romans. Right? So that's like us saying, you know, we're Christians, but then we say, I'm an Australian citizen too. I have rights as an Australian citizen. And have cast us into prison, and now do they thrust us out privily? What are you saying? Secretly. Nay, verily, truly, let them come themselves and fetch us out. See, they want them to be shamed for treating them that way as Roman citizens. And the sergeant told these words unto the magistrates, and they, look at this, feared. They feared when they heard that they were Romans. 
Now look, I don't know if this is the case today, maybe the rulers that be and the powers that be don't really don't care about whether we exercise our rights or not, but I'd just like to be encouraged by this verse that it's, it seems to show us here that God is encouraging us that if we stand up for our rights in a country like Australia, they are worried. You know, I mean, if they, if they weren't worried, would they be trying so hard to like censor, you know, on Facebook and all? Would the powers that be, if they weren't worried, would they be trying to censor people and trying to stop them and stamping out, you know, labeling it all as misinformation? If it didn't affect anything, then they wouldn't do anything. The fact that they do stuff means they do worry. So it's like, don't be discouraged. You know, when you stand up for your rights, you take a stand in a place, people are worried. Just like here, when Paul stood up for his rights as a Roman citizen, the magistrates, the judges there, they were worried. They feared. Because Why? Because it encourages other people to do the same. Right? And they have to try and keep everyone under control. But when things start to pop up, you know, they can't. You know, it's, like that. it's like the ants moving, isn't it? When they all start standing up, can, can they stop that? They can't. And they came and besought them and brought them out and desired them to depart out of the city. You see how they say, just like, hey, you know, get out, you know, because... And they went out of the prison, entered into the house of Lydia. So again, Lydia, again, hospitable. Bring them in, surely they had to heal from their stripes and, and all the things that happened. And when they had seen the brethren, they comforted them and departed. So again, we see here in Acts 16, the troubles, the trials that they went through and enabled them to encourage and exhort the brethren. So there's still profit in all this suffering that they went through. So this lesson at the end here, hey, those in power still concerned with those that are, they are unable to silence standing up for the, their rights afforded to them as citizens. Okay, so hope you learned something there today. Let's just, just go back over the lessons I wanted you to bring, take from this chapter. So first one was, Mothers, remember with Timothy, Lydia having an influence on the family, mothers can have a lot of influence on their children's spiritual direction, even with an unbelieving father. That's the first lesson. Second lesson, to be an effective soul winner, we need to be aware of cultural biases. And the more we can relate to people, the more effective we can be. Right? Third lesson, Dreams and visions, direct communication, still happen, potentially, but must always align with Scripture. And it shouldn't lead somebody to put their feelings over truth, right, over the Word of God. Number four, sometimes the reason why God closes a door isn't always immediately evident to us, right? We've done all we can, sometimes we have to have faith, maybe the door is closing because God has another door ready for us to open, like we saw with the reason why they went to Philippi. Number five, Lydia is a great example of a godly woman. Right? Six, Lydia and the Philippian jailer are not examples of infant baptism. All right? So hopefully that's clear to you now. And the last one that we just talked about, we must know our rights as citizens right? and exercise our rights against oppressive rulers even in persecution. Why? Because they fear citizens standing against them and exposing their corruption. All right, let's pray. Lord, uh, help us, Lord, to you know, live as we ought. And um, thank you for the encouragement and the lessons here. And I pray, Lord, that we would be you know, even half as much as Paul and Silas and some of the people we read in Acts. I'm sure if we were, Lord, this, this, this world would be a very different place. So I pray, Lord, you use us, give us the grace, give us the strength, give us the wisdom, give us the boldness, Lord, to, to stand up for you, preach the gospel, and be great citizens of our country. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.